I have known Brett uh, Stanchu for a long time, uh, as a customer at the bookstore, as a friend, and as a coworker for a little while. Um, I've been also able to get to know her as a writer through her blog, Stony Soil Vermont, and her debut novel, Hidden View, which um, was a pleasure to host uh, her book launch for that book, also at the Galaxy Bookshop. Um, and I want to thank you, Brett, for letting us be your host bookstore for your book launch. Um, her writing is sharply observant and poetic, whether she is writing fiction or nonfiction. You will find these qualities in Unstitched. Over the course of Brett's journey to make sense of the suicide of a, ma a Woodbury man, leading ultimately to a reckoning with addiction, its causes and effects on our communities. Brett, uh, Brett spoke with many people in her search for information and understanding. Addicts, counselors, law enforcement, healthcare providers, and it led to some deeply personal revelations. It takes bravery to look problems like addiction in the face, and it takes bravery to share a story like this one. It is with humble gratitude that I welcome Brett Stanchu this evening. I'm going to take my mask off, and I hope that's okay with everybody. I am vaccinated. Yeah. And I want to say thank you to all of you for coming out tonight in this most unusual reading. Uh, these are strange times, and the last time I was in the Hardwick Townhouse for a reading specifically was for Howard Frank Mosier. And it was late in the fall, and the heat hadn't been turned on early enough. And for those of you who are familiar with the townhouse, you know how cold the townhouse can be, and everybody just pushed down to these first few rows. And I don't think that's going to happen tonight, or maybe even for a long time, but that's still the memory I always have of this townhouse. And thank you for coming here and participating in this also historic moment in our town. I first want to say thank you as well to Sandy, Scott, and Andrea Jones, and to the Judavon Library for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Tonight, I'm going to talk just a little. I know all of you are wearing masks, and I'm going to talk just a little about how I came to write this book, Unstitched, and why I wrote it. And then I'm just going to read just one page, and then I'll take a few questions, and then I'll answer any additional questions later if anyone would like to. Um, I want to say first before I begin that some of you know me in various ways, and probably some of you may not know me at all. And Unstitched is a book that I never set out to write. My first book, as Sandy mentioned, was a novel named Hidden View. It was fiction, and it was about a family on a rural Vermont farm. I'm a journalist, I'm a blogger, and an essayist, but I didn't set out to write a book specifically about addiction. But the circumstances in my life had really changed, and this is how I came to write this book. A few years ago, I was working in a library, in a little tiny one-room library in Woodbury, and I was recently divorced. I was struggling with certain things in my life, and someone kept breaking in after hours. And I slowly became aware of this, and I didn't know what to do. Um, there are two things that are important to know, although this book isn't really so much about this incident. It was rumored that the person who was breaking in was using opioids, and it was also rumored, I also was afraid of being tangled up in his story. I really wanted nothing to do with it. I just wanted to go on with my life. But I was tangled up in his story anyway. And I talked just briefly about this man who I didn't know. The book isn't really about him. But it's about what happened when he died in a very violent way. And it made me all of a sudden stop my life and think, what might I have done differently? What had happened? And how was I a part of this story? And when I think back on my life at that time, I think about this. There was a, there's a novelist named Francisco Goldman, and his young wife died when a wave came across the ocean and broke the vertebrae in her neck. And she was a young woman, and they were swimming off the coast of Mexico. And in his memoir of her, he describes how this wave came for days across the ocean and then apparently randomly just knocked into her 
and ended her life. And when I look back at my life at that time, I can see that so much had been rushing towards me and gathering strength for years, all apparently without my cognizance. And a line from the book that I wrote on Stitch describes me at the time, and I say, I was beginning to wonder if I was a minor character in a much larger story where the plot line wasn't clear to me. And the plot line at that point of my life was not clear to me. I was tangled up in a story that was much larger than myself. It was about me, and it was about addiction, and it was about the community. And the book I wrote on Stitched results from asking questions that stemmed from that night. And very quickly, I realized that what I was afraid of was not this man who broke into the library. I never knew him, and I wasn't afraid of him. And again, this book is not about him, but the book is about the questions I ask. And since I was a librarian at the time, I did what librarians do, and I hosted a forum on opioid abuse in our area. And so I reached out to local people in the area. I reached out to women at the Hardwick Health Center. I reached out to Chief Aaron Cochran. I reached out to EMS volunteers. And I also reached out to a man who was in recovery. And the forum was hosted just down the street at the Memorial Building on the second floor. And there were a number of people there, all from, all were there for their own reasons. And at the panel table, probably just by coincidence, Chief Cochran sat next to the man who was in recovery. And as each one of the panelists spoke, it became clear to me and it became clear to everybody who was in the audience that the chief had arrested this man and he was the one who had initiated the process for this man to go to prison. And this man had been in prison for quite a while, and his first son, in fact, had even been born in prison. But as the forum unfolded that evening, the chief and this man spoke to each other. They talked about that incident. And they even, they even exchanged almost kind of a laugh about it, although there was nothing that was funny about the situation at all. And listening to these men, two men sitting side by side was really revelatory to me because I began to see how incredibly complex the situation was. There was this one man with what he had struggled with sitting next to another man who was in law enforcement. And I began to see that the stories of our lives braid into each other in ways that are very, very complex, that are often not at all visible to our eyes. In the book that I wrote on Stitch, I want to be really clear, I'm not either advocating either for or against incarceration, and the book is not political and it's not didactic. And the costs this man had endured to become sober were to me just staggering. But for me, participating in this conversation really made me begin to ask more and more deeper questions and it made me look at myself and realize that I had hidden in my own life because behind a kind of stigma that I held against people who used opioids. And I had also hidden behind my persona as well as a public librarian. So that's a little bit of the backstory of how I began to write this book. And then w once I knew I wanted to write the book, I had to then put pieces of my life together to figure out how to get the time and space to write a book. And this part also doesn't appear in here. But I had to write a proposal, I had to then send it out, and I sent it out and sent it out, and I reached out to other writers in their area, asking them for advice, asking them what I could continue to do to get it better. And in the end, I ended up choosing Steerforth Press. Um, it's a little press that's run out of Lebanon, New Hampshire, and the day that I got the acceptance from them, I also got another accept, I, I got another offer as well too, all within half an hour. And it was this weird sort of like, here the stars were beginning to align for me to write this book. And then shortly after that, I also got a uh, Vermont Arts Council creation grant, which for me was huge, and then another grant from the Humanities Foundation. And the reason I'm saying those is, the book is written, I wrote the book, but it, the book had real help along the way too. And those grants that came from the taxpayers were a huge piece for me as well too. And it raised the bar higher for me because it gave me, it gave me a certain amount of confidence, but it also indebted me in a certain way to say, here, we trust you to produce something. 
go ahead and produce it. So those pieces, I, I have to acknowledge, were invaluable to me. Um, then once I had the pieces together to begin to write the book, I had to think about what I was going to do. And very quickly I began to realize as I began asking more questions that the issue was not so much just about opioid abuse but was about abuse was about addiction as a whole. And in On Stitch, there's two themes that unfold. And the first theme is my process of really acknowledging my own stigma against addiction. And I begin to educate myself, and I begin to lift up that veil that surrounds addiction to really try to understand it and re-examine my views. And some of this involved asking questions about the physiology of addiction. What is it? What's the process of recovery? I also write about crime. Crime and fear are a big part of the stigma around addiction. And in the process of asking questions, I began to interview a number of people. And I'd like to acknowledge a few of those. Some of these people are here tonight. Jerry Wolberg from the Hardwick Health Center and Katie Whitaker were hugely helpful for me. And both of these women really pushed me to think in depth about what I thought about addiction. The book is divided into three sections, body, mind, and heart, and that really evolved out of my conversations with these two women. One of the questions that's frequently brought up about addiction is whether it's a disease or whether it's bad behavior. And these two women really pushed me to think about what's visible to the eye immediately, behavior, but also what's not immediately visible to the eye, both regarding the physiology of our bodies that we don't fully understand and also how complicated are our lives as well and how our bodies fit into that. I also spent time with Hardwick's police chief, Aaron Cochran. He also helped me see the imprint of addiction in a different way in the community through crime and through fear. Dave Iacovoni, who's a representative, he also met me at the Hardwick Health Center. Um, and although his interview didn't end up in the book, we had a really interesting interview on a day when they were working on the diner and we kind of crouched over my cell phone because I taped it. And he gave me a real insight into economics and the common good. Um, but all of these professionals, and there are other people who appear as well in the book, they all emphasize that, that addiction is a collective story with a very long past. And to understand the proliferation of addiction now, each of them assisted None of this was prompted by me, but they all insisted that we had to first understand the past. And then the, the other set of interviews I did are with people who are in recovery, and all of these people I'm incredibly indebted to. And in the end, I chose three very different stories that ended up in the book, and these are, again, the actual names of people. And I chose them for various reasons mostly because they're three different stories, but also because all three of these people were phenomenally self-reflective, and they were really thoughtful about their lives and their journey that they had taken. There's Meg Goulet is in the book. She's a recovery coach at the North Central Vermont Recovery Center. Shauna Shepard is a medical assistant at the Hardwick Health Center, and Sam McDowell is in human resources. And then I also met with a couple as well who had lost their daughter, Jenna Ray Tatro, to an overdose. Um, they have spoken very, very publicly about their struggles. And for those of you who are familiar with them, they are running Jenna's house in Johnson, Vermont. They are a, also a phenomenal couple. And for me, it's really important to say that I'm indebted to everybody who spoke to me. And many people never ended up in my book but I'm really particularly indebted to the people who really had struggled with addiction. And I can't emphasize enough that this is incredibly remarkable and courageous, how they had spoken to me and what they had offered me. I was very rarely refused an interview from anybody, and I realized that anyone who either has experienced addiction or who works with addiction had a very different mindset about how to help people. And our society often feel like we're driven towards a calculus, a financial calculus, where we appraise each other and try to figure out maybe how we can get something out of each other. I never had that from anybody else at all. The impetus was always, 
What can I do to help other people? In my book, I quote a line from Shauna Shepard who says, recovery is possible. And this is a line that she, this is what she responded to me when I asked her, what would you tell someone who's struggling with addiction? And that word possible ends up over and over and over again in my book because it's not a simple word. It's an incredibly difficult word. But that is really where the shining hope is. And the second thread that goes through the book is also a very personal thread. And it's been my own struggles with addiction and how I hadn't really wanted to examine those, even though I thought I had left those long ago in my past. And I could have written a book when I first started writing that was written from a very clinical point of view. I could have used a lot of data and statistics, and I do have those in the book. But I knew to really write about addiction, I had to force myself to face myself too. And I had to put myself in the story because I wasn't out of the story. I had been in the story from the get-go. And that was the thing that took me forever to realize that night is that I am in the story. Charles Duhigg writes in his book, The Power of Habits, what he describes as the personal scum line. And that's that unique place for all of us where we refuse to descend any further. And maybe some people never hit that point in their life. Maybe people hit it all over the place in their own certain ways. But for me, I hit it at a certain point when I realized I had to all of a sudden stop and listen to the story around me and realize that I was a piece of it. That was terrifying for me, but it was also empowering. And in, in a strange way, when I reflect back on it, it was the same experience that I had becoming a mother, realizing I was part of the story, both terrifying and both empowering. While I was writing this book, I spent a few days in Maine with my family. And here's the other element that winds into this. And I ended up buying a book in an indie, in an indie bookstore, of course. And it, it's about people in Papua New Guinea. And there's a line in it from Karl Marx that I later looked up. And the line reads, it begins with the word men, but I'm going to alter that to people. And it says, people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. And I kept thinking about that book and thinking about that line and realized it applied to my life, but also to the people I was writing about. And we're all born into circumstances we don't choose in a particular time and in a particular place. And this brings me back again to where I began at the beginning with that wave of the past that comes at me. And we're all part of that wave. We all have our own stories. And now I'm at a point in my life where I can look back all the way to my own past and see that my parents' lives and what they struggled with washed into my life as their parents before them, as my life has shaped my daughter's life. And that's true for all of us. We live in cha challenging times right now. I'm sure no one here would dispute that. And Unstitched comes out of those challenging times. It comes out of looking, where are we at this time? What is the wave of the world that we are in right now? There's two last things before I read just briefly from the book that I want to say. And the original working title of this book was A Good and Hard Place. And this book has lots of very, very hard things in it very hard things. I'm not a feel-good writer. But it also has a lot of good things in it, too. And it has the rewards of parenting, the pleasures of friendship, and my own real love affair with living in Vermont. I see this very much as a Vermont book, although it may reflect much more. And I also want to say a little about the format. This is a book of creative nonfiction, and I've altered time frame, and I've changed many names. But the names of everyone I mentioned tonight is her, his actual name. And while I've worked as a journalist before, this book is not journalism. It's not a transcript of any particular event or events. And I look at writing, or as any art, as a carefully honed lens and as, as a really sharp and penetrating way to look at the world. And the people I write about in Unstitched have enormously complicated lives, like all of us, that could never be contained in any single book. 
But I look at literature, or maybe even art as a whole, as a series of windows and mirrors. And writing can help us see ourselves in those mirrors much more clearly, as writing this book helped me see myself more clearly. But literature also offers us windows to open our minds and hearts to experiences and people we hadn't known before. And we need that now more than ever. That's been my experience as a writer, and I hope if you read the book, that's your experience as a reader, too. So now I'm going to read just one. It's just, just about a page. Um, and this is just to give you a sense of what the book is like. Um, and this takes place after I had spoken with Katie Whitaker, who was a nurse at the Hardwick Health Center at the Hardwick Diner, and I'm walking home in the sleet that afternoon, and I live in Hardwick Village. When I left our house that morning, my daughter Molly was mixing dough for cinnamon rolls and listening to Stephen Colbert, and I longed to be in our warm, lemon-yellow kitchen, sweetly fragrant with the yeasty scent of rising dough. I cut through the cemetery, as I hurried through the sleet, I remembered the winter Molly progressed from crawling to walking. Strapped for income, I took a temporary job working for the 2000 census, collecting data in nearby hard scrabble North Wolcott. On one stop along a dirt road, an older woman invited me in from the cold. Her mobile home was situated on a ridge. The snow wind sculpted so high around the trailer that not much of the rest streaked metal was visible. Clutching my census clipboard, I followed her down a hall reeking of ripe garbage. Our trainer had warned us census workers about folks who would view government employees and a checklist of questions with skepticism and sometimes outright hostility. What I hadn't expected to find were lonely people hungry for company at the tail end of bitter winter. In the kitchen, her husband sat in a wheelchair beside a window with a view of a snow-covered field and the distant mountains. On the kitchen table was a paper plate printed with green holly and bright red berries. Her hands trembling a little, the woman painstakingly removed saran wrap from the plate. Beneath it lay half a dozen white star cookies sprinkled with pink and purple sugar crystals. The woman urged me to try one. She offered to put on a kettle and make tea. Politely, I refused both. I was there on business with a stack of forms and dozens of stops to finish before I headed home. I couldn't afford to linger. Through the bare branches of trees, I saw the red tin of our barn roof. Where the footpath wound through the hydrangeas and joined our lawn, I paused, my soaked jacket clinging to my shoulders and body. Nearly two decades and a lot of living later, my refusal of that cookie and cup of tea shamed me. Standing in what promised to be an all-day, maybe days-long frigid rain, I knew Katie Whitaker would have relished the cookie. Thank you. So I'm happy to answer just a couple of questions. I really, I really appreciate all of you for coming out here tonight. And if you could see the view from where I am, you would realize just how totally surreal this is. <laughs> and I can't thank you all enough for putting on your mask again and coming out tonight. But I am happy to answer a few questions if anybody has any, or I'm happy to answer any afterwards too. Yeah, Diane? Can you talk about the interview process a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, I interviewed and I taped all my interviews. I, I, I told people that I was taping them. Um, I taped them with my cell phone. And, and some people I went back repeatedly and asked for more details or more clarifying details. Um, it was interesting for me because some of these, some people I had met before, like Jerry Wolberg, who was one of the women I interviewed, I originally met Jerry when I did this forum, and then she gave me all kinds of stuff afterwards and just let me ask question after question after question. Some of the more personal interviews were really hard, and 
if you read the book, you'll see in there just how, how vulnerable and how open some of these interviews were. Um, and then I was also lucky enough, the, the oddest interview I did was with Christina Nolan, who was the US attorney at the time. And I called her up and asked her if I could come interview her. And she said, sure. So I went there. And I didn't realize, because I'd never been to a federal building, that I couldn't bring my cell phone in. I couldn't bring anything in except a piece of paper and a pen. And so I went upstairs after they frisked me, and then I just took notes rapidly. And she was also incredibly open and incredibly lovely, and I feel I was really lucky. For me, it was an incredible experience. Yeah. If that answers your question. Uh, Lisa. Um, how was it working with an editor? I would also say this was also one of my incredible strokes of luck with this book. I had real pieces of luck all the way around, doors that opened up for me that I really didn't expect to have open. And I turned in the rough draft of the book right before the pandemic happened. And then I was asked to rewrite it with an editor. And the editor I worked with through Steerforth Press um, lived in Morocco and left. She went back to San Francisco. She was pregnant with her second child. She and her husband got one of the last State Department flights out of Morocco because the world was shutting down. And she was living with her parents in San Francisco while the fires were burning all around them. And so she had a lot of time on her hands too because, because <laughs> her life was also in an odd spot. So we sent stuff back all the time. She was an incredibly good writer. But there was, for me, also a deadline because she was about to have a baby, too. And she pushed, she pushed me to write about things otherwise I never would have written about. And I credit her with making this a much better book. So that was a huge stroke of luck for me. And then if we're all set, I'm happy to break apart here now, too. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. And thank you all again for coming. Thank you again to Sandy and Andrea as well, too, and the Judavon Library. Thank you.